Every year, tens of thousands of dogs, mostly beagles, are used as tools in deadly research experiments. Join me, your host, Ellie Hansen, as we dive into this issue and talk to all the awesome people out there trying to make a difference for these dogs. Best of all, find out what you can do to help. We're opening doors for discussion and shedding light on the facts. This is Dog Research Exposed. This was a transatlantic recording between Montana and the USA and the United Kingdom. As such, there are a few imperfections in this audio. However, please keep listening as it does not affect the quality of this dynamic conversation. I've been thinking a lot lately about conflict and how uncomfortable being in the middle of conflict can feel. At the same time, I believe some conflict is necessary in life. Experts in conflict mediation even describe the emotions in conflict, like anger, as initiatory and energizing. Conflict brings important debates to the forefront, like animal testing. Conflict forces us to see the issues and face them, regardless of where we stand. Otherwise, How can important change happen if we are all quiet, emotionless? Peaceful protest is one form of what is known as good conflict. Yet, how many of us ever get the opportunity or the courage to grab a banner and raise our voices for something we believe is unethical or unjust? John Curtin is a veteran animal rights activist in the United Kingdom who now heads up Camp Beagle, a protest that sits right outside the gates of Marshall Bioresources, or MBR, at its Cambridgeshire facility. It's just one of MBR's many breeding facilities operating around the world. MBR, an American company, breeds beagles and other animals for biomedical research. Their global facilities are usually hidden from the public, often in small countryside towns, as is the facility where Camp Beagle is stationed. For over 18 months, people from all over the world have come to protest at MBR, making Camp Beagle one of the largest and longest-running protests ever waged against a company using dogs for research. And just like its name implies, Camp Beagle is a camp, complete with tents, food, and anything you would need to stay and engage in, in John Curtin's own words, real-world, boots-on-the-ground protesting. It's good conflict in its most visceral form, and it's gaining critical media attention for beagles destined for death in research labs like never before. As you can imagine, John Curtin is neither quiet nor emotionless. In fact, just hearing him talk will make you want to grab a tent, a lawn chair, and a megaphone and head to the United Kingdom to join him at Camp Beagle. Courage and an unfailing determination and love for beagles in research are all laid out in this heartfelt episode of Dog Research Exposed. Camp Beagle is quite an amazing project that has gained international attention and support in a short period of time. In fact, I don't really know of any other protest for laboratory dogs done on this scale and for this long that has ever happened in history. So how exactly did Camp Beagle get started? Uh, the thing to bear in mind about Camp Beagle, maybe this is something to learn in life, is that I wouldn't have really got involved if it had been a planned thing. If 18 months ago, if someone said to me, do you want to spend the next 18 months on the side of a road out of a dirty, stinking, rotten dog factory? I'd have said, no, thank you very much. 
but it just grew. It grew organically. It came from one woman who went to a very small demonstration outside the place, and she just said she couldn't leave. You know that feeling after a demonstration when you walk away and maybe you can. She could still hear the dogs crying, and she just said, "I'm not leaving." So her, another friend said to her, "Well, I can't leave you here overnight," and the word just spread. And within a few days, I was down there, and basically, I've been sort of kind of stuck ever since. So. Yeah, you, you, there's nothing been like it before because you. I wouldn't have been mad enough to plan this. I'm going to live on the side of a road for 18 months. No, so it's happened through a sort of organic, magical process, really, and we're still there. And we're absolutely determined if it's going to be another 18 months, if it's going to be years, we're prepared to stick it out now. It's like the battle lines have been drawn. Do you know approximately how many dogs are at the MBR Acres facility where you're camped? and that you hope to set free? Okay. Everything to do with animal experiments. Every single element is a secret. It's impossible to find out. We know how much capacity they've got. They've got capacity. It's a massive, giant factory, up to 2,000 dogs in there. I would guess, and I know the site well now, at any one time, there's about 1,000 dogs there, I'd say, 1,000 puppies. And over the past year and a half, you've been at Camp Beagle. What progress would you say you've made to free the MBR Beagles? We've made massive progress, but my heart sank when you asked me that question because the dogs are still there. But we've, we've every single day for 18 months now, 18 months, we've, we've put the message out. This is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. We've, we've banged on about it. And sometimes in life, Something is so bad that you you have to keep keep at it, and so we've just been making the, the same news headlines every day for eighteen months that this is wrong, this is wrong, and so in terms of we we've reignited the debate about vivisection. I've been involved for forty years, four zero years in the anti vivisection movement, and when I joined the movement back in the eighties, animal experiments were on top of the agenda. Animal experiments went off the agenda and veganism took over, farmed animals. Now we've got, and Camp Beagle has been instrumental, we've got the animal experiments back where they belong, in the spotlight, in the public agenda. So that's our main achievement. But what we want to achieve is to to liberate those dogs. Nothing else will do. So you live at Camp Beagle 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Your camp is basically a large tent. That's definitely a commitment, especially when the weather is bad and the temperatures are cold. Why did you make this decision to live there? Yeah, um, we, I, I, I've got a small camper van. We did begin um, in tent, spending the winter in the tents. I still, still I sleep in a tent sometimes in the winter, but it's rough. And the tents were, to begin with, it was harsh. You know, we literally had tents on the side of the road. It it was a matter of while you were asleep, you were constantly having near-death experiences because we were right on the verge. But what keeps us going is, I mean, I've I've, I've got that gene in me. I've been doing campaigning now for 40 years. So I've been able to encourage the others because, especially now the new generation, everyone wants things done in a flash. We want these, like, dramatic moments and yes in activism we produce dramatic moments but our real real key to success is to just keep going dogged determination literally dogged determination to learn from the beagles about determination camp beagle defines itself as a strictly lawful advocacy group with your primary objective being to free the beagles bred at mbr and to ban animal testing in the UK. And you do this through a public awareness campaign, lawful pressure tactics, industry exposure, and by challenging the current law with scientific and ethical arguments. And even though everything you're doing is within the law, do you ever feel hassled by law enforcement in any way? Uh, no, but the, the the authorities, to a degree, have tried everything they can to do to get rid of us. MBR, the company, they've spent 
one and a half million pounds in legal costs to try and get rid of us. They brought an injunction out against us. I have been arrested outside there. I've been charged, but found not guilty. The charges don't stick. And um, uh, what we found out when the because the police massively overreact all the time against us, but when they do and they pull us up in front of the courts, we get found not guilty. So yeah, we. Um, but basically, it's very hard to demonise us because we've deliberately stayed within the law. To me, it's not a really a moral choice about what we're doing at Camp Beagle. It's a tactical choice. We're broad daylight. We're under the cameras. We need to be able to stay there for so for tactical reasons. We, 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 we scrupulously stay within the law. And because you're a veteran animal rights activist, this is probably nothing new to you. Animal liberation from research facilities is something you've been involved with for a very long time, dating back a few decades at least, I believe. And you even spent some time in prison for liberating 82 beagle puppies and 26 rabbits from a company called Interfauna, another research breeding facility in the UK. Yeah, Um, that's right. Interfauna is MBR, same place. It's like one of the tricks that the vivisectors do, the animal experiment. You watch, they always change their names, their company. Once their names get known, they change them. When you try and find out who's behind these companies, like just as simple as MBR Acres, we we call it for like common sense reasons, for simplicity, an American company. But when you try and follow the money from MBR Acres, it's honestly like trying to track down some Colombian cocaine cartel. The money goes, the, 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 they set up all these parent companies. There's about 10 stages before it gets back to Marshall Bioresources. It ends up in Denmark at some point. We call it like dirty fingers in dirty pies. So that place that I got done for is the same place that I'm camped out now. And I, I went to prison for 18 months for liberating, yeah, like you said, 82 beagle puppies and 26 rabbits. What is it exactly that keeps you going every day and never giving up despite all these obstacles you have faced in your life? The same love, love. And compassion. That's it. Love and compassion. And and a burning sense. I'm going to say hatred, but I try and get rid of that word out of my life. A burning resentment towards injustice. You know? And what they're doing to these beagles is just clearly wrong. They're just treating them as objects. And it's we've always I'm on in those 40 years, I've spent most of it attacking the morality of animal experiments. But you watch the results that we're going to get now. Now we're getting into the science. And it's the science, I think, that's finally going to stop it, which is sad. You think we'd we'd say, oh, we shouldn't do this to other creatures. But we do. But once we can show, and more and more scientists are standing up now to say that this is not only morally bankrupt, it's scientifically bankrupt. It doesn't help. When you're sick, let's keep it simple. When you're sick, you don't go to a vet. We didn't want to go to a beagle specialist if your child was ill, would you? Let's keep it simple. And it it doesn't work. Experiment on a a dog doesn't tell you about what's going to happen to a mouse. Experiment on a mouse doesn't tell you what's going to happen to a rat. We need safe clinical screening. And yet we're doing experiments that were invented 100 years ago. I tell people about like mobile phones. My mobile phone that I'm holding that has more computer capacity than the entire NASA space missions of the 60s and 70s. They used to have to build warehouses to build those computers. Now, on my phone, I can fit more computer capacity, but yet we're still doing the same insane animal experiments that that were dreamt up 100 years ago by the industry. Anyone visiting Camp Beagle is described as being on the front lines. Can you describe a typical day at Camp Beagle? Typical day, okay. Um, The security arrive at six o'clock and we've got an alarm on the gates. I sleep normally next to the the gates. So each car that goes in because they try and sneak dog vans in, it sets off our alarm. Then the workers come in at about eight o'clock and then we'll get the drone up to see what's happening, to see what's happening. We, we fly the drone over there every day. And the, like yesterday, they were doing lots of moving around and we got lots of really good footage. They literally move the dogs around in trolleys as if they're in a 
because it is a factory. It's an assembly line. And that's how they treat the dogs. They move them in a trolley as if they were moving, you know, metal objects or something. So the morning could comprise of like perhaps flying the drone. People will always come by. People stop by. And we literally always invite people, come by for a cup of tea and some cake. So we've got that. So people can just drop in and say hello to us because we're physically there. We're not just a social media phenomenon. We're in the real world. And so the workers come at eight o'clock and they leave at four. So that's eight o'clock and four o'clock. It's very important that we pick at the gates. And the rest of the day is just taken up with surveillance, social media. Um, like I said, we get lots and lots of visitors. Yeah. So no two days are alike, but yeah, we're always busy. So if I wanted to camp at Camp Beagle, what would I need to bring with me? Can you describe what the camp is like for someone who would want to go and join the protest? Nothing, because we've got everything we need. People really do look after us. You know, we've got a lot of kindness put away. People are always asking me, what do you need? What do you need? And all I literally tell them is love. And then people send us things anyway. So everything you could want, we've got spare toothbrushes, spare socks. Uh, extra clothes, sleeping bags. We've got spare tents. You wouldn't need nothing except you, honestly. We've got. Whole, we've been there 18 months now, and we've had a lot of experienced people help us. We've got a kitchen. We've got a shower, fully fitted kitchen. Um, yeah, we've got everything. We've got toilets. You name it, we got it on the side of the road. So you mentioned that you get a lot of visitors. Where are these people coming from? Does anyone visit from the U.S. or is it mostly Europe? Uh, we have had some people from the United States, but they were over in England on holiday anyway. And they, they came along to see us. Yeah, lots of people from Europe. We've had visitors from uh, the Scandinavian countries, uh, from Finland. We've had lovely visitors from France, from Spain, from Ireland. Yeah, we're just there. We're there. So we're physically, to me, the thing I like about the camp is that it, at least we've got boots on the ground because life is getting overtaken by this social media and, and the way we activism, you know, the way we just press our screens. At least the camp is old school. It's old school. We combine the two, old school, and then we use the new technology because we wouldn't be able to survive without the support we get really off social media, but we're not dependent on it. Do you know what I mean? I do know what you mean, and I love what you said about having boots on the ground. Camp Beagle has been there for over a year now, and in the United States, the First Amendment protects our right to assemble and express our views through protest. And the same is true in the United Kingdom, where everyone has the right to peaceful protest. Perhaps not enough people take to the streets for organized protest. However, if we in the United States and the United Kingdom, actually anywhere in the world, are to be a voice for getting dogs out of research laboratories, I believe we've got to speak up. We must get things shaken up, for a better word. And what are your thoughts as to how protest can support this cause? I think there's a process of zombification taking place. We really have to be careful about our connection with social media and the phones. And we don't lose sight of the real world. Remember? You know, the, the, the real world is there. So, yeah, there's a, there's a real... I, I've seen it over the decades. And that frightens me to think that we're going to be, you know, resigned to protesting from our from our bedrooms. No, we need to we need to go back on those streets and we and it, and if if we stop doing it, we'll we'll lose our place there, and that they'll bring in new laws and it will it will stop us. So we need for me, it's very very important that we're there in the real world and we embrace all the modern technologies, but boots on the ground. You know, we need to get together and it's encouraging to get together. The thing that keeps us going at the camp is the people that drop by, you know, maybe they've traveled for like three hours and they're only going to stay for a few hours or an hour or so, but they'll, they'll come and have a cup of tea and some cake with us. And it's that that keeps us going. But also we love the social media, but there's nothing like a trip to the camp because then you get to hear the dogs, you get to smell. We try and do our best to convey, but there's nothing like the real thing. So many people cry when they come to the camp. 
Yeah, and I wanted to talk about that. What should protesters be prepared for at Camp Beagle, emotionally speaking? I've seen the videos of the death vans, as you call them, full of beagle puppies headed to the laboratories to be tested on and killed. And it's just plain awful to watch. I can imagine that being there physically is much, much harder. It is. I don't know what toll it's taken on me, but I can tell it, it's it's taken its toll on me. It's sort of it's wiped the smile off my face to a degree. It is hard, but I'm prepared to do it. I'm there by choice. And there's not many people that actually are prepared to knuckle down and do it. And... I used to cry a lot more than I do. It's actually stopped me crying. You'd think I'd cry more, but I, I worry. I used to cry a lot there, and I don't cry anymore. And I hope I'm not getting battle-hardened and I'm too hardened to it. But it does damage you, you know, like because it, it's relentless. But the reason for our success is it is because it is, it is relentless, and it is 24-7. We try and look after each other, and we force each other to leave now and then. We sort of, you know, because you can tell when someone's cracking up. And I've definitely spent too long there. You know, I need to be dragged away from there continually. Many listeners may not realize that the largest MBR facility for breeding beagles for research is actually in the United States. As of 2019, Marshall Farms had over 23,000 dogs in their breeding facilities destined for experiments. That is a staggering number. This interview is an opportunity for you to extend the mission of Camp Beagle to people in the U.S. who are listening. What would you like to say to rally more support for the MBR Beagles globally? While we're in different countries, the issue is the same and our hearts are together in this. Absolutely. To be, what we did at Camp Beagle... We wanted to, we thought, right, we're going to do our thing and we'll be a springboard. People will be encouraged. People will be inspired. People will be infused by what we do. And to be honest, we're still waiting for, for America to jump on board. We're just beginning to get some interest now. There's a group called Rise Up for Animals, which have done some campaigning in the past about marshals. They're quite powerful people stateside. And when you, I, I've been told when people have demonstrated, Outside the New York facility, they get a terrible time from the cops. But when I was told that, my mind immediately went to, don't let that stop you, you know, get hold of that banner, stand outside. And as bad as what it is, a cop, a picture or film of a cop trunching in someone to the ground just because they're trying to peacefully protest is going to help the dogs. So just because of the fact that the cops give you grief, you know, uh, don't let that stop you, people. I know it's tough, but look after each other. But come on, America. We're, we're, we're still waiting for you to, to get on board, actually. But it's just beginning to happen. That's the good news. We're just putting our tentacles out there now. And we've got, we're in contact with France, uh, where MBR have got headquarters. Uh, and we're just about to actually set up some international meetings with some activists that are there already. So get on board. The time is now perfect. Just in the 18 months we've been there, we do our research, we make all these allegations of cruelty, of abuse, of scandal, and MBR never, ever respond. They never, ever defend themselves about anything we say. I could tell you anything today, and it won't be refuted by MBR. They're, they're so used to operating in secrecy. They've got no idea anymore of how to reach out themselves to the public the morality is one thing but what about the science what about when we say these experiments are useless they are, show us one experiment that the mbr dogs have been used for that's done actually any good silence just silence and that's got to be, what, 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 what's that about you know that, that in itself i just i just think all i'd want to say really is that this is going to be stopped Animal experiments are going to be an embarrassing legacy when we look back on them of the 20th century. How were we so foolish and stupid? But do we have to wait 20 years for this to happen or 10 years? Because this is a scale of change. When you deal with sort of massive institutions and governments, you're talking decades to change things. 
If that's what it's going to take, then that's what it's going to take. But how many lives will be lost? It's a disgrace what we do. And to be honest, I hope that, to me, the animals, the, the, those beagles act as ambassadors for all victims of violence. They really do. Um, and if we don't need to do it on dogs, scientifically, then we don't need, we don't need to do it on mice and rats either. You know, but but we break people's hearts about what's happening to those dogs. And I feel that when I'm there, I'm doing it on behalf of even all the chickens and the pigs that never see the sky as well. We need to make a breakthrough and let's do it through this Beagle campaign about we can't treat animals like this anymore. We can't treat the earth as an object and we shouldn't never treat any animal as an object. They're worth more than that. It's a simple point. If you want to follow and cheer on Camp Beagle, tune in on their Facebook page at Camp Beagle and be sure it's the official page. Or check out their website for more information at thecampbeagle.com. Thanks for listening to Dog Research Exposed. Check out our website at www.dogresearchexposed.com for more resources and actions you can take to help dogs in research laboratories today.